Hello, welcome back to Blue Harvest Toys. Today I'm going to be talking a bit about advertising and marketing, considering some of the strategies and the advertising produced that helped made Corgi Toys a success. It's recognised from the outset that the value for money, keen competition and good communication would need to be major considerations for the launch of a new range of Corgi diecast models. After a good deal of planning and experience in the manufacturing of toys, it was clear that any product would need to be potentially better and certainly more desirable in order to compete successfully with so many other diecast manufacturers. Corgi Toys began to release models in 1956 and the Corgi Model Club was established in the same year. Every member would receive a numbered certificate, a cast Corgi lapel badge and a newsletter the first of which was sent out in December 1956. The most cost-effective method of advertising the club, however, was to place an application form for the Corgi Club in each box and every model sold. The early models from 1957 also carried advertising in the form of a concertina leaflet with illustrations of the models currently available. These also encouraged you to join the Corgi Model Club, but were eventually phased out as the catalogues became more useful in showing the range of models available. The size, shape and application form changed over the years, but the message remained the same. Join the Corgi Model Club. Applicants were asked to complete the form with name, address and age, and to enclose a postal order for one shilling and sixpence to cover postage and membership fee. The application was to be sent to the club secretary at Playcaf Toys Limited, 120 Margate, London, EC2, and that was the 1962 application leaflet. The club secretary was Bill Baxter, who was also involved in the marketing, advertising and PR, and went on to become Corgi's product manager for a few years. Besides the obvious need to have a communication link with these Corgi fans, the information became very useful with regard to marketing. Corgi was able to track the age range of those who were buying and collecting the models, and this informed future planning related to product and advertising. In year two, at the beginning of 1957, the first Corgi catalogue was introduced. This showed the releases from 1956 and the first three months of releases from 1957. This coincided with the first Corgi advert to be shown on television. It was screened during family hour and was broadcast nationwide. Advertising was also planned and placed in regular publications including comics. This is probably where most of us remember reading about Corgi toys and anticipating those follow-up trips to the toy shop. The various comms used by Corgi had a significant impact on sales. Furthermore, Corgi established a system of selling new releases to retailers on a regular assumed basis, which meant that a certain number of sales were almost guaranteed. These communications and releases were increased during national holiday periods and especially in the run-up to Christmas. The production standards were regularly reviewed and measures introduced to ensure the product arrived at the retail in the best condition possible. More detailed forms of advertising were made available to individual shops. Window cards, stickers and labels, posters and three-dimensional display units all played their part. Even coupons on certain cereal packets with money or free funds were used. No doubt to good effect. As with all the small products sold cheaply, it is the accumulation of multiple sales which brings success. Such was the determination to engage the public that a travelling Corgi display van was used to visit trade shows and motor racing meetings. The primary function was to enrol new members and display the current models. Local stockists were informed when the display team would be in the area so they could use the publicity to help their own sales. Apparently the team travelling with the van included the designers at Corgi. They used these opportunities to hear what the customers thought of the product. Another innovative outreach idea from Corgi Toys for the days of forums and social media. The most positive aspect of the advertising in all its forms and the growing popularity of the Corgi Mod Club was that it led to a degree of self-perpetuation. There must have been a certain assurance that club members would buy new models in the same way that many of the retailers had agreed to take a number of the models each month. The colourful shop displays certainly caught your attention and the introduction of the Corgi catalogue made choosing a new model easier than ever. The catalogues which were purchased and taken home proved to be the important link with a local toy shop and a constant reminder of the toys available for that all-important birthday present, 
Christmas surprise or pocket money spending spree. The huge volume of leaflets, catalogues and material which were dispersed when the models were originally released has now become an important archive. The easiest way to have access to this type of material is through established publications, collectors magazines and price guides. For example, the early Constantina leaflets can be very hard to find in good condition and at a reasonable price, but they are well documented in a number of books. Likewise, some of the harder find leaflets are often featured in collectors' publications. There are also books which were published during the 1960s, such as the Korg Annual, all about cars and motoring, released in 1969. This annual uses Corgi toys that were available and on sale at the time. This is a typical annual and it evokes the late 1960s very well. It shows models set in dioramas including pages of facts and figures together with colourful storyboards. The best reason for all this building up of an archive is the ability to cross reference stories, anecdotes and articles and to investigate particular facts about specific models. Most people enjoy researching their collections and learning more about the items. Whatever they collect. It is certainly useful to know which models are hard to find, together with the notational value placed on them. It is also a good idea to establish the number of colour variations that might be available. I suppose the most interesting aspect of any fact finder mission, however, is the way in which we are drawn into the years surrounding the models itself, the model zone time zone. As the information builds up and the picture grows, we are able to steal a glimpse into the past. So I hope you enjoyed that little look of advertising in the past and the way things used to be done. And I certainly think that some of the current toy companies could learn a thing or two. But we won't go into that here. Please thumb up the video if you enjoyed it. And please stick around and subscribe if you're new. So thank you for watching and until the next time, may the toys be with you.